Is it time to start Kelly Olenek? And is that how we solve the turnover problem? Or are there other answers to that? It's next on Locked on Jazz. But um bum 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 pow. You are locked on jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. How are you? I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA Insider. And this is Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Today, we look at Kelly Lick, the one player on the Jazz who's having a positive impact, who has a positive plus minus when he's on the floor. Is it time to put Kelly Linick back into the starting lineup for the Utah Jazz and pivot from the John Collins start? Or do you do it for Walker Kessler instead? And the turnovers, revisiting the 22 turnovers of yesterday and where I was wrong and what that means for the Utah Jazz, plus some late game watch with some really interesting things going on in Milwaukee, as well as a return to the post. What? That's all coming up on today's edition of Locked on Jazz. Locked on Jazz is your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz, giving you insight, expertise, geeky numbers, and hopefully making it way better to be a Jazz fan each and every day. Thank you for making Locked on Jazz your first listen. We are free and available on all podcasting apps, including YouTube. I guess our YouTube question of the day is, is it time to start Kelly Olenek? And uh, thank you to the everydayers. Uh, Today's show is brought to you in part by FanDuel. FanDuel with the... Uh, makes every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with an any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. We're in Indianapolis. The background today on YouTube is the field house, gorgeous field house. Um, so I went and saw pink last night. I love pink, totally huge pink fan. And uh, didn't know she was in town and happened to find out after we arrived when I was in the gym and ran over and saw Pink. It was great. Um, So just thought I'd share that. Um, That is, you know, little stories of the road. That's actually one of the few times. And this town, this city's perfect for it because uh, you can walk to the arena. And so um, it's easy. All right. We're all trying to find solutions. The Easiest one in most people's mind is that they want to see um, Keontae, and we've talked about that a great deal. We'll probably talk about some more today as well about regards to the turnovers. Um, and I and I, I actually think that's getting more and more legitimate by the day, and probably feels as though you know if if some guys can't take care of the turnover issue, and we're going to have the turnover stretch. I, I really think the turnover stretch that open the second quarter was kind of like a threshold moment. And maybe I'm overstating that a little bit. Um, But when we committed five turnovers in six possessions to open the second quarter the other night, um, I think two were by Chris, two were by Taylor, one was Ochai. And they were, this isn't where I was starting the show, but I guess this is the primary thought on everyone's mind. And they were literally sometimes dribbling turnovers and sometimes just passing turnovers that we crossed over some like threshold of patience, at least in my book, maybe just that's just being the announcer. Um, And so I'm really probably out of line a little bit to say that, but the feeling that I got was that that stretch was significant. I even, I went, we went to break. I asked Ron Boone at the moment, like, does that feel like, that's more significant than just like a bad stretch of missed shots. And I have a tendency to do this. I, I get overzealous and overstretch um, on that. Um, this is really funny. This was actually the second segment of the show, and somehow I flipped them. Maybe it's a sign of what you guys actually really want to talk about. Um, and so I just, I think some sort of changes have to arrive here shortly. Um, and I don't, know what they are we've talked a lot about Keontae and he's close and he's coming and it's just a question of like when is he ready when does he have his voice 
when is the team ready for it? When is the locker room ready for it? When is it abundantly obvious? And it's a move that like has to come a week later than maybe a week earlier. Like that's the way this works. Um, I don't know that that solves the turnover problem because I think Keontae, you know, didn't get across the eight second line the other night. And then Keontae threw the pass off Kelly's shoulder when they didn't communicate. Um, and so I don't know that it totally solves that problem. Um, but I do think that that stretch of five turnovers in six possessions was significant. And just the more, and, and as we were, and, and as I shared with you yesterday on the show, like there are certainly some cases of bad spacing. Um, and then that's a question that we'll get into with, if it's time to start Kelly Olenek. Um, and that's and and the bad spacing comes from John. I don't think is totally comfortable yet on where things are, um, and brings his man into into lane a lot. The guys aren't following him out, and then we just we're getting ourselves deep into the paint with three defenders around us because they're collapsed. But there actually is a moment before we get caught into that where that pass has got to come out. And honestly, that's where Keontae has done that better than the other guards so far. Like Keontae is, it was a, two plays recently that jumped out to me on Keontae. One was he was on the left baseline. <clears throat> this was at home. It's such a nondescript play. Um, but it just kind of was a sign to me that he just intuitively gets it. Uh, where he was on the left wing, drove baseline. They were suckering him into a pinch uh, clamp down on that baseline. He took two dribbles, stopped, got off the basketball, and swung it back out. Sounds really stupid. Sounds really basic. But actually, what we've been doing too often is taking two more dribbles and then realizing we're in trouble. So, he, and then there was a play even last night. It ends up in a turnover by the end of the possession, but not on him, where he drives to the free throw line, stops, realizes this is going to get super crowded. I'm getting out of here. Um, just in a way that we haven't been making that play. So there are, like, so in, in regards to how to solve the turnovers, as I just totally dyslexic this show and flipped it, to solve the turnovers is, one, we've got to make our passes earlier. Two, we've got to recognize what the opponents are doing defensively and where we have a lack of spacing and where driving lanes actually exist. It doesn't mean you can't drive. We have to bend the defense. We have to bring that defense in. Like tonight, Indiana allows a tremendous amount of shots at the rim. They lead the league in allowing shots at the rim, and they're like second in the league in denying threes. The amount they deny threes is outrageous because they're putting, they must, we'll have to see, they must spread out so dramatically. So you're, you've got to drive. But then you either have to drive at an angle where you can Nash dribble it out or you've got to drive understanding where your passing lanes are and when they're going to evaporate. And honestly, from the film I've watched, that actually might be where Keontae is ahead of Talon and Colin and Jordan. Maybe not surprising. None of them have really played a lot of point guard. Talon's played six months of point guard last year, three months of point guard last year. Colin's never been a point guard. Jordan's never been a point guard. And Keontae's played point guard only for half of his senior year in high school. It just feels as though maybe his instinct on some of those things is superior. So the question on turnovers is is better spacing, which I'll get into here in the next segment with whether or not it's time to start Kelly. And then play John as the five is the way you do that. We'll get into that. Better spacing, better recognition of what defenses are doing. And then I hate to say this, but like dribbling and passing. Like that's the threshold to me that we might have crossed over was like, we just had dribbling and passing mistakes. And when you have dribbling and passing mistakes, it's like, that's so. Does Keontae solve those issues? He might have some instincts that are more natural to it, but I still think he'll be fairly turnover prone. But I do feel like that five turnovers and six possessions was somewhat of a threshold moment. All right, now we'll get to where I started the show, <laughs> which is, oh, that was really weird. Um, I have notes right in front of me that tell me exactly where I'm supposed to go and didn't go there. That's the beauty of being live. Um, let us, um, so you just have to deal with, you have to deal with David's crazy brain. 
sometimes. Um, <clears throat> maybe it was too much pink. Uh, let's get this party started. Uh, that was again dealing with David's crazy brain. Uh, let's let us let us uh, talk about Kelly. Uh, and whether he should be starting here in just a second. Today's show is brought to you by my good friends over at Intercap Lending. Steve Carter is just simply the best. It's a crazy time right now in the lending world. The interest rates are not easy to deal with, so you actually really, really need someone on your side who can figure out, all right, here's our best options. This gives us the best flexibility for when times come back around. Here's the best way to do it. What do we do? Et cetera. Um, and Steve Carter is that guy. He is approachable he explains it well he's bright he's nice he's considerate and he gets to you right away it's the most incredible customer service experience i've ever had in anything like that because frankly i've done two mortgages with him and i actually would never get anything done if it wasn't for him uh so give steve carter a call or email me first at dlock09 at gmail.com and i'll just set you up with a vip meeting uh, if you don't want me in your business that's fine then call steve at 385-800-8528 that's 385-800-8528 intercap lending nls number 19 0465 for more information visit intercaplending.com make sure you tell steve you're with locked on so that you get the locked on corporate discount that we have set up for you uh which is why it might be valuable if i email it over to you uh so please send us uh that information and jump aboard um and get to taken care of with the vip experience today's show is also brought to you by prize picks prize picks how fun great way to be involved great way to enjoy it you choose what you're going to jump on you don't have to go up against other people. That makes it unfair because some of those people are sharks. This is a great way to do it when you are actually just picking uh, against the numbers. Prize picks is most fun when you can win 25% of your money. This season, you select two more players, pick more or less on projected stats, and place an entry. That, they also now have special leagues, so you can combine football and basketball across leagues created specifically with combo projections. You also can play along with player favorites, uh, very comedians and rappers and fun things like that. Uh, what is Tyrese Halliburton going to do tonight? I looked at some of the uh, numbers on combined things like that. You can have some fun with that uh, as well. Uh, Prize Picks offers a reboot policy, so entries stay in place even if one of your players gets injured for football or basketball games. If you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return the second, there's a reboot. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with the insurance policy. Right now, it's time to give you a chance to get your first deposit matched up to $100. So go to prizepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA. That's prizepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA. Use the code LockedOnNBA for your first deposit match up to $100. Thank you very much for making Locked on Jazz your first listen of the day. All right. This might be numbers-based. I kind of think it's, uh, frankly, visually based. So, visually, John Collins doesn't look comfortable yet. He's putting up nice rebound and point numbers. Um, though I always have this thing I wonder. This is probably not totally true about John. But I always wonder this. Like, what's the baseline? Like, if you play, P.J. Tucker probably is below the baseline on this. But, like, if you were to play 30 minutes in an NBA game at six foot nine, like, what is your, like, what do you just, and you're good. Like, you're, you're like, a decent player. Like, so, John Collins, you're good. Like, what do you just get numbers-wise? Right? Like, and then what's the numbers that you get if you're actually, like, having an impact beyond just your presence. Does that make sense? So John's averaging 15 points, nine rebounds, playing really well, um, shooting 37%. The one thing that jumps out is if you just look at our pure plus minus numbers, John's minus 7.4, Walker's minus 9.8. Um, so that jumps out at me a little bit. And that tells me that maybe those minutes together aren't the greatest right now. So I took a look at that and took a look at, all right, so what happens in our lineups when you have both John Collins and Walker together? And I and 
I don't feel like John has quite figured out how to play with Walker. And so this is what's tricky is you kind of feel like you probably want to give that a little bit more time. But when the two of them are on the floor together right now, we're minus 20. We're in the 8th percentile offensively and the 5th percentile defensively. Ouch. And I don't know if not eight games is enough time to, like, start to make this change. But that jumps out. What is John Collins without Walker Kessler? Well, now we're minus 4.2. So that's much better. Still the defense is in the 21st percentile. Still fouling at an outrageous rate. And we're in the 60th percentile offensively. And what is Walker without John Collins? And Walker, obviously, has not looked right until last night. Um, I thought he was really good uh, two nights ago. We're still minus 17. So Walker without John's not great. But if I go back a year, and some of that's, and even if we, like, okay, well, that had Mike Conley. And that certainly is is wildly different. But if I go back a year ago and I put Walker Kessler, Kelly Olenek on the floor together, the Jazz were two plus 2.7 when Walker was on the floor. And if I put Kelly on the floor, so I've got space, I got a ball mover, I got a passer, maybe I solved the turnover. We were plus 0.8 in those minutes. Not great, but not minus 20. And then if in all fairness, you take Mike Conley off the floor, I just want to be like fully transparent of why this is like not a no-brainer. Um, if you take Mike Conley off the floor, now we move to minus 0.6. If you look at our on-off numbers right now as a team, so Kelly's our best on-off player. Our offense is 16 points better when Kelly's on the, per 100 possessions, better when he's on the floor than when he's off the floor. And the only area where it's really dramatically different and maybe a little bit um, is uh, the free throw rate is a little abnormal Um, on both sides, frankly. Uh, We're fouling too much when Kelly's on the floor and we're not, we're getting, we're getting fouls all the time when he's on the floor offensively. So that's, it's a little strange. And again, we're, you know, we're 157 minutes in for a sample size. The defense is the reason why you don't play Kelly. He's not a very good rim protector. His rebounding's not great. Um, and he's not very quick laterally. The reason you do play Kelly is because he's an incredible ball mover. He's got great vision. He's a great leader. And we keep hearing about communication. He's probably the speak the talker on this team at this point. It's not a it's not a loud group of players. Um John's again putting up really good numbers, but like we're worse defensively on the floor when he's on the floor than when he's off the floor at the exact same rate as Kelly. So I wonder if we go back to this kind of when we first got introduced to John Collins, is it possible that John Collins will be better if he comes off the bench, plays the five? I talked about this in the offseason. Like, I thought he'd be amazing as a backup center against, as playing the center against backups. I thought he could really be a force. Um, And maybe that gets some sort of pick and roll game going either with Keontae, who's showing nice combination with Lowry, or if now, if you ask, I always believe, by the way, Gordy Chiesa taught me this. If you're struggling and you're going to make a change, you actually should make multiple changes so one person doesn't think they were singled out. Which I think is really a good point. Um, You know, Gordy always said, you got to change two. You got to change two. Um, we saw a little subtle change the other night that Kelly Linnick came into the game for John Collins instead of for Walker Kessler. Like, so there was a little, this was like the first sign that maybe trying to get Kelly back out on the floor with Walker and Lowry earlier might ignite Walker. Then Walker had his best night of the year. So maybe that worked. Will's really working hard at a bunch of these things and un, has a has a logic and an approach to why he's doing everything he's doing. Um, so it's just a thought. Like, I'm again, I kind of talked about this yesterday. I'm trying to go on this road with you. I don't have answers, There's certain, but I do think, like, I'm sure you guys are all thinking about these things. And, I understand 100% why your first answer on everything is Keontae because it's super fun. And he's our 16th pick, and he's probably a f- future piece. Um, and I am, you know, I said this, I, I want to stay consistent. I-, I actually this whole time have been, like, at some point this year, I fully expected that we would be like Keontae George, 
Well, I said this before the draft that we would be our new point guard, Ochai Baji, Lowry Markin, our new power forward, and Walker Kessler, and we would win 24 games, 26 games. Like that was what I thought this year was. Um, and I love what I actually like everything so far, other than like the way the play has played out. Like, okay, like let's take the last 25 games of Chris Dunn and let's take the last 25 games of Taylor Horton Tucker and let's see. Let's see they're both what pieces are they where they fit what their pieces are and i unfortunately said this i think the five turnovers and six possessions was like a threshold moment like oh god it like just got so bad um that okay like now like it's a little bit of a um oh what's that phrase when something in the market forces something to happen um yeah i can't think of it not that smart so um that's the that's kind of my my thought on that is whether or not Kelly ignites Walker a little bit, opens up the floor for ball for passing, um, might be the talker. Um, I hadn't thought about this before, but his veteran presence might actually complement Keontae. Maybe Kelly and Keontae are the same time whenever you do this because Kelly gives some ball handling relief for Keontae and helps him out a little bit. Um the pick and roll gets better because it's space better if you're trying to play with Lowry. We've not played a lot of pick and roll this year. I don't know. I'm just talking through these things with you, frankly. Um is is the way I was looking at it. Um so I don't know, just get your thoughts. Be interested to hear what you guys think on YouTube on that. I mean the plus minus numbers are gra- drastic. The Walker John the John Walker combo is pretty dramatic that it's not working. But it's also so early and like John just doesn't look comfortable yet as though he understands what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it um, on either end of the floor. Actually, Um, it's pretty remarkable. He's putting up the numbers as well as he is, considering the fact um, that I just doesn't he doesn't look naturally comfortable um, to me or that he's executing exactly what's supposed to be done, which is really a tribute to John. that He's putting up uh, pretty great numbers um, at this point. Shows you how talented a player he really is. All right. uh, Late game watch, one of my favorite things. There's some really interesting things happening in Milwaukee. There's some really interesting trends in the NBA. Um, so we'll talk about all those things as we continue on today's show called Locked on Jazz, your daily podcast. And by the way, today, Utah Jazz and the Indiana Pacers, 5 o'clock your time. If you have Sirius XM, you can listen to the broadcast on Sirius XM. And if you uh, take your link your smart speaker at home, you can literally just tell your smart speaker to play Utah Jazz Basketball on Sirius XM. Today's show is brought to you in part by FanDuel. I was reading an article today, and I don't have my phone over there, that had what Tyrese Halliburton's over-under was today on um, points and uh, assists combined. And it was a number higher than he's achieved in any game all year other than the time in which he scored 41, I guess, against Charlotte this year. So they're expecting big numbers from the number two offense in the NBA against our defense. Um, We'll see. They're not very good defensively, and they allow a lot of shots at the rim if we can get on the cup. Uh, Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you're thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over unders and more. Go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's $150 if your team wins tonight. It's popular uh, same gate parlay bets they all have up there. They focused on the Washington Charlotte game. It's the first one out there. Good games tonight. Boston's two and a half point favorite at Philly. Indiana's a six and a half point favorite over the Jazz with an over under at 242. They scored 150 the other night. Uh, Clippers are four and a half point favorite in Brooklyn as James Harden's going to play. Uh, Wemby's playing in New York for the first time. That'll be quite the scene. And the Knicks are a 10 point favorite uh, in that one. Uh, we're being to get some big lines in the NBA. Cleveland's at Oklahoma City, another great game. And the Pelicans in Minnesota, the Timberwolves are a seven and a half point favorite. It's all at fanduel.com slash locked on. Thank you very much for making Locked on Jazz your first listen of the day. All right, late game watch. Super interesting game yesterday. Not yesterday, the day before, because we had no games because of the election yesterday. Uh, Milwaukee went back to Giannis Middleton two-man game, and Dane became a 
bystander. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting things going on in Milwaukee. Um, I did pinpoint that I thought they might not be great this year. We'll see whether that turns out to still be true. They seem to be coming through in the clutch late in games to survive what has been really a dreadful start statistically. Um, and they should be much worse than they are. So this might be a key stretch because they get through it. Um, but what's interesting on that is uh, on the late game watch there is Brooke Lopez also got taken out of the game for Bobby Portis. So they're benching Brooke Lopez late. I, that is a important veteran voice in that locker room. I'd keep a close eye on Milwaukee. It's it's interesting times over there. I'm surprised by some of the things Adrian Griffin's doing. Um, but it was really interesting the other night that, like, they literally went to the Giannis-Chris Middleton two-man game. Dame would bring it up. They would run their little action, get Middleton isolated on Giannis, play the pick and roll with those two like they used to in the old school time. And it came through in the clutch, and they got on the win. Giannis uh, powered through for a bucket late. Middleton hit some pull-ups, um, but it was very clear that like Adrian Griffin was trying to re-engage those two at a higher level. And I thought, you know, when I analyzed Milwaukee, I had three things that I was worried about about them. One was that they their defense wouldn't be good anymore. It's terrible. Two was that their bench is so bad offensively that they and they weren't good offensively last year that they would really struggle offensively. That I had them, I think, at like 18th in the league. And then three, and I don't know what they are right now, but I think they're about 18th in the league. Um, and three is that they don't have, they had too many possessions. And I think we're beginning to see that one come through a little bit. Like someone's got to take a really big back seat um, along the way. And like Jay Crowder wants, is always going to get his shots up. Like he, you know, so they're, the problem is that the guys they added, they're all Cameron Payne, James Harden, some of those kind of guy, or James Harden, uh, Jay Crowder, are guys that actually use a lot of possessions. Um, it's early in the year. So, we, you know, again, but it's not that early, by the way. I just want to point that out. But Milwaukee is 4-2 and two with a minus 6 differential. That is a miracle. They rank 27th defensively and 12th offensively. So let's see. Um, some of the other things that are really interesting going on right now is... Um, there's less switching going on defensively. Like in the Sun Spurs game the other night, the Spurs didn't switch. Um, by the way, Wemby is just incredible. Um, I think you know that. Um, uh, but we're yeah, we're seeing a lot less switching than we've seen. The other thing is we're seeing a lot more teams run their offense through the post. And not just the Jokic high post, like the old school post. Rockets are running everything through Alfred Shingun in the post. Spurs are running everything through Zach Collins in the post late games. Toronto's running Scott everything through Scotty Barnes. Scotty Barnes is having an explosion. Scott there, which makes Pascal Siakam really interesting. Like, I don't know how he fits. Pascal Siakam is now just standing outside the three point line as Scotty Barnes runs the offense, and he's not a very good three point shooter, and he's not great if he's got to take more than one or two dribbles. Um, and he's a free agent at the end of the year, so I think it's going to be really interesting to see how he deals with that. Um, so you're you're watching teams run like, you know, a lot of lot of that. Um, still old school two man interchange at the top. Um, Willie Green's running some great stuff for the Pelicans. He at this time last year I was talking about as well. He runs some. He runs probably the most creative stuff I've seen. Basic some stuff out of the horn set with C.J. McCollum, who he now doesn't have, uh, with Zion Williamson. Um, he hasn't had Brandon for a bunch of games there, but they run some really interesting kind of actions um, there. The one that's also interesting is the way Pop's using Wemby is he's coming from the baseline and either cutting on a slice cut up to the free throw line or all the way to the three point line. He's just open every time. Um, so those those have been kind of the super interesting takeaways late in games um, so far. The Lakers are really 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 lebron dependent like it's interesting he is still the point guard holds for most of 24 seconds makes the plays and comes through it's it's incredible um that he's actually able to do it would be the most incredible um aspect of it uh overall but so a lot of really interesting little trends here in the early going in late game um to keep an eye on jazz and the pacers tonight pacers quick few notes for you on that one um, Pacers come in, according to cleaning the glass, as the number two offense in the NBA. 
They may come in as the number one offense in the NBA if you count blowout time um, because of the fact that they scored 150 points and they got blown out in a game. They've actually scored 150 and allowed 150. Yeah, they're the number one offense in the NBA at 120 points per four points per possession. Halliburton's averaging 24 points a game and 11 assists. So that's 12 assists. That's going to be quite the matchup uh, for the Jazz. I don't know who guards them um, there. Um, I mean, when I did our opening lineup to start the year, I had Ochai literally playing like 46 minutes a night because of that. They're 25th in the league defensively, both in the half court and in transition. They allow the fewest threes in the league at 25%, which is a crazy number, but they allow the most shots at the rim. So we're going to be playing that drive game as well. They do not force turnovers. They're 29th in the league at forcing turnovers. So let's see if we can uh, avoid the turnover plague in today's ball game. All right. I don't know when, you know, those were just thoughts um, for you to play around with, chew on, have fun with, discuss over the water cooler. Uh, and we'll see uh, what the jazz have coming for you. It has been locked on jazz, your daily podcast in the Utah jazz. Thanks to all the everydayers out there who tune in every day. I greatly appreciate you.